the uh, our work session for October 7th. Um, we'll start off, start off with item 1.1, 1 .1, uh, new and or revised policies. Good evening. We have one policy this evening for the board's consideration and approval. This is um, the board did approve the superintendent's recommendation for a mandatory vaccination requirement on September 16th. This is a policy revision to policy GBE, which supports that requirement. Um, we recommend approval of this revision to policy GBE at your regular board meeting. Are there any questions? Go ahead, Joanne. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, yes, I see that this policy um, addresses staff and volunteers. What are we doing about um, contractors and subcontractors and just all the people who are in and out of our buildings? So with contractors and subcontractors that we have MOUs with, we are working through our MOUs to ensure that we also have them meet this requirement. And with contractors who would otherwise are not with us through an MOU, they would need to meet the requirement as well. So are we trying to make sure that everyone who comes into all of our buildings is vaccinated regardless of how they're, they're the role that they play? Yes, that is the goal. Okay, thank you. And I can't see everybody, so um, please speak up if you have a question or a comment. Okay. Oh, go ahead, George. Uh, hold on. Yeah, you know, I thought it was very well written. I was going to say it sounded like the lawyers maybe looked at it. Um, if not, that's a compliment to whoever wrote it. But um, I think Joanne raises a good point, and I, I don't think it's fully addressed by um, this at all. I, I don't know if, if we want our, I mean, how much control we have over these other people who come in, but um, that that's kind of a little bit of a, not really a loophole, a little bit of a gap um, in this policy as written. So we did um, have legal, our district legal team look mm -hmm. at this as well as um, MSBA. And this is the recommendation that has come out of both of those reviews. And again, um, I don't know if we would ever get to 100% with everyone who comes in and out of our school district day in and day out. That is definitely the goal. And we will be working with all of our MOUs to see, for example, with transportation, if they have a vaccine, a mandatory requirement, what that looks like um, with SSD. We will work with all of our um, providers to see what their requirement is to see if it aligns with ours. And if they if it doesn't, then we would have um, mandatory testing in place if there are exemptions that they have with their employees that um, would prohibit them or would, you know, in some way prevent them from being fully vaccinated. Does that help explain, Mr. Lenard? Um, can I speak really quick? I think um, I think we all need to recognize that this policy GBE is staff health and safety. You know, it starts with TB tests, <clears throat> um, and it talks about some other things. It's not about contractors, so I don't think it would be appropriate within this particular policy to put in language about contractors and things like that just because of the nature of the actual policy, if that makes some sense. Yeah, thank you, thank Dr. You, Dr. Yeah. Thank you for that. But I did want to just make sure that um, the board knew and understood that we would be working through with our contractors to ensure there is compliance to the, the, the best degree possible. Right, but our our ability just to to mandate something is different um, in the case of contractors, and it uh, is limited by and derives from the contractual agreements or memoranda we have. So, um, as long as the administration is um, working towards that end, it it, it uh, answers the question. So, for me, thank you. Thank you.
no one else has any questions or concerns, we can move on to item 1.2, the stu uh, student services update. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Thank you. And this right. is Mr. Gary Spiller. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, Joe Miller and myself will be providing you with uh, student services and wraparound services update. Um, again, this, uh, this evening, we're going to be unpacking our humanizing pillar as it uh, pertains to the work that we do uh, with our students um, from all angles. It'll be a little bit different as we're providing a, a pictorial update tonight. Um, and we will be looking at a regular update uh, with uh, tons and tons of data uh, in June of 2022. Um, but tonight, again, we will be going over um, just where we are uh, as far as wraparound services go, restorative practices, um, panorama, and things of that nature. So uh, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, uh, wraparound services. So this is, uh, to Gary's point, this is a kind of a, a pictorial um, update, but let me speak to it. So in the, in the top right, in the bottom right, in the bottom left are all uh, pictures of food distribution or getting ready for food distribution, right? As a reminder, we distributed almost uh, a million meals between March of uh, 2020 and August of 2021, so a bunch. Um, and we continue that work. Um, in the uh, top left is uh, some of our um, volunteers, well, our staff, our student services staff, uh, working with Kids Smart to pack uh, backpacks full of school supplies. And we started the year with about 1,200 backpacks of school supplies for students. If you move more to the middle, of course, you see our superintendent putting some shoes, brand new shoes. Um, on a kindergartner, uh, and right below it, you see that, uh, that kindergarten boy, boy bought both that girl and the boy are at Barbara Jordan. Um, very proud of his new shoes, by the way. I witnessed it myself. But um, there were 180 new shoes for 180, new, uh, for 180 kindergartners across all four schools. And then we're getting ready to give away uh, about 50 more shoes. And that was uh, with Sneakers with Soles um, provided those shoes. And that, that was very exciting. And we got some great press around that too, but but really first and foremost, uh, just to see those kindergartners get so excited about their shoes was just awesome. And then in the middle there, of course, is a, a bunch of bikes. And uh, we were able to give uh, away 50 brand new bikes to uh, families, to students. And that was um, compliments of all nations church. And so it's just an example, you know, just as a reminder, we have 40, about 40 service providers in the district and uh, you know, it ranges from you know, all of these things to counseling and, and various other services that are embedded within the buildings. We're, we're really lucky to have you know, nonprofits and the faith community and all kinds of other partners uh, that we work with. Um, they're doing a great job. And this, you know, this is really part of our, well, when we think of it, kind of what our, our seal, our social, emotional equity and academic learning, kind of this, uh, wrapping around students and uh, families and meeting whatever needs, um, whether it's basic needs or just the uh, needs of um, joy and well-being. And I would just yeah, I would just add that with these partnerships, you know, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we we do. Again, to the focus on the health, the education, and overall well-being of our students and staff uh, have been uh, just amazing obviously pre-COVID, but really they, they stepped up and stood out uh, throughout COVID and have continued to do the same uh, as we've come back to school. So uh, again, our wraparound uh, partnerships with those 40 plus uh, groups and agencies has been amazing. We can go to the next slide. So um, just a quick update with restorative practices. We are in year six uh, of our restorative journey. Uh, there's been a lot of amazing mile markers along the way. Um, from us, uh, you know, having uh, the only restorative class that I'm aware of in the region uh, for students to learn about restorative restorative work, uh, the resolution that you as a school board uh, put out there, um, again, that has been good and, and strong and found uh, fundamental for us. Um, reframing our student expectations guide, uh, working with the ACLU to work on restorative lens and language, all that's been great. Um, we know that in our district, um, our premise, our theory of restorative work is that 
people are happier, uh, more successful, more cooperative, and willing to make positive changes um, when systems do things with them instead of to them or for them. Uh, so just a couple of quick highlights um, on our restorative work here are these. Uh, one is we are in the final year of Project Restore. If you remember, uh, that is uh, the grant that we've had that's funded a lot of our efforts to help us move uh, the markers down the road. This year with Project Restore, we're going to be hosting a regional professional development with a gentleman named Eric Butler, uh, as we're going to show his documentary called Circles, uh, highlighting some of the work that he's done in New Orleans and in Oakland. He'll be coming in for that. So our staff and students will have an opportunity to learn and grow with him. Um, we're also going to be doing other professional development. We're going to be offering a master class um, for uh, our LLC students, uh, again, on some of the topics that are related to Panorama. Again, that is part of a restorative effort. We're going to be doing building updates, really focused on the class of 23 as we're growing them as leaders, um, but that will continue. If you're looking at some of the images on here, um, I'll start with the one in the middle. A restorative space. I think when we're thinking about, you know, entering in, um, our, I, I know many of you have seen our new LLC um, corridor in the high school. That is restorative unto itself, uh, creating a space where our, our kids and our staff, um, you know, want to be, or it's intentionally inviting a place that's bright and engaging, a uh, place where they can learn. Uh, I know some of you heard the artist say, hey, uh, that we worked with on the darkest, dreariest day in January. Uh, we wanted to inspire. Creating positive spaces like that uh, help us to uh, focus in on uh, restorative nature. Um, we continue to do yoga, uh, as you see here. Um, you, we continue to do meditation, as you see in the lower right, which was uh, part of our wellness hub at the high school this past spring. These things are restorative practices unto themselves, as well as trauma-informed practices. Um, there's been a number of restorative events, again, uh, with the premise being with. Uh, those events can be the Growing Together event, which was focused on wellness with our community. Um, our back to school rally is a traditional event here, but again, with the focus of doing things with community, with police department, that's been a priority for us. Um, as we know in our district, it's people over programs and relationships being at the heart of everything that we do. Um, that is the premise of our restorative work. Uh, again, from this last year, normally I would give you data at this time with the suspension numbers or infractions, uh, behaviors that led to suspension. Coming off of COVID, those numbers are a little skewed. So we're reestablishing a baseline. We'll go back to whenever we get together in June uh, to look at the 2018-2019 year and look at a comparative analysis of the 2021-22 year. Um, as again, there's been a big impact from COVID when we're looking at, uh, you know, apples to apples with uh, numbers through a restorative lens. So again, I uh, just want to give you that quick update. Joe, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think the only thing I would add here is just a, just a reminder that, um, you know, restorative practices, trauma-informed and culturally and linguistically responsive teaching strategies are all kind of part of the relationship tree, the, the, the graphic that you all have seen, and it, it's all part of relationships, right? Those are kind of foundational pieces of developing relationships uh, with students um, and staff. Thank you. Next slide. So just as with the restorative work, we're year six of our trauma-informed work. Um, again, I always uh, want to, uh, shout our superintendent out. This was um, a point of emphasis when we came in uh, was to make sure that, you know, we are a trauma informed district and we've continued that work. Uh, this past spring, as you're aware, we've got the children's service. We were awarded the children's service fund grant. Um, with that, we were able to expand on our partnerships to uh, expand on this work. Um, we have three partners who are doing uh, tiered, uh, a tiered approach to the work with us this year. Um, the first partnership is uh, a, uh, one of our foundational ones is with Alive and Well. Uh, we're able to expand on professional development from a trauma-informed lens and cater that specifically to the needs of our district and our buildings. Um, they have done trainings with our new teachers, our substitutes, uh, student services personnel. They're in every single building working with resiliency teams, and, uh, and that's all been great. One thing that we're going to continue to expand on is work with our community and our families, uh, upcoming uh, they'll have some community empowerment workshops, as well as uh, parent workshops as well, to help us grow and get stronger uh, as a trauma-informed community. 
Uh, at the elementary level, we're partnering with uh, Candace Cox and her organization, which is Keep Healing and Overcoming Struggles, uh, also known as an acronym of CHAOS. Um, Candace uh, will be doing some universals for our elementary age students uh, and talking to them about resiliency and equipping them uh, with some life skills uh, to help them cope and navigate when things don't necessarily go uh, their way. She's also doing, her team's going to also be doing some uh, small group work uh, with the identified or targeted group of students to help them uh, continue to grow um, socially and emotionally as young people. And then one thing that we're really excited about is we're going to be getting 180 hours of support for intensive services for kids most at need. Uh, and that's been crucial, uh, that especially coming back from COVID. I think that that support is going to help our, our children a lot uh, at the elementary level. At the secondary level, we're partnering with the collective, and the collective is going to help us to continue with our journey of well-being and this trauma-informed work. Um, they're going to be doing uh, some work to equip um, our, our young people, our adolescents, with uh, tools such as mindfulness, yoga, and the ability to reset um, you know, when, when things don't, don't necessarily go their way. On a tiered approach, they're going to have some small group work where we're working to develop humanizing leaders. Uh, to, so the kids will also be doing turnkey stu student leadership in uh, the area of wellness, uh, self-care and community care. So uh, that's exciting. In addition to that, the, you'll probably be seeing some videos popping up uh, that uh, teachers and student services personnel or even parents at home can go to to help, um, you know, uh, their kids to uh, and themselves to get back to balance. Um, those will be housed in our Peace Place, which is on the website as well. Um, with the trauma-informed work, we know it's about people. I know we've we really worked to shift uh, our language from the what's wrong with you to what happened to you uh, and begin to unpack that um, just with the understanding of you know, ACEs or the understanding of adverse childhood experiences, understanding of brain-based science, um, and really, I do believe that we've taken some steps in our trauma-informed journey, our trauma-sensitive journey that we've been on. Uh, Joe, is there anything else you'd like to add here? Yeah, the, the, just the one other thing I would add is again that the, um, you know, our this work can be very challenging, and if our staff uh, aren't well. Uh, that's uh, generally not good for the students. And so part of the work too is to make sure that we, you know, this is a, a great picture because this represents a couple days of training, substantive training for the student services and wraparound services team. But we ended it with kind of a fun uh, Olympics kind of um, event that, you know, just honored the joint well being for the staff because we want to pour into our staff because we know the, they are the vehicles to get to student success and student impact. So I think we can go to the next slide. So the, the, the question of course is how do you measure joy and well-being, right? How, how do you measure all this stuff that we're doing? And I think that um, Panorama is as good of a measurement tool as we have, right? For students, for staff, for families. And uh, so we're in the middle of our fall administration right now for students, staff, and families. Um, I am excited to report that, uh, you know, we're at about 60% response rate for students, which is, by the way, good, given that it doesn't close until October the 22nd. So uh, we're, we're actually doing better already than we did last time. Just, um, you know, I think we, we continue to improve and learn how in this environment we can uh, you know, increase the survey uh, percentage. So that's, that's great. Um, certainly Panorama is part of how we measure um, even the strategic plan, right? I mean, how we measure elements of not all of it, but elements of the strategic plan. Um, and, and I think it's maybe to say two other things about Panorama. One, it really represents true data-driven decision-making on behalf of students. We can drill all the way down to the student level with Panorama. Joe Miller, fourth grader at Pershing Elementary, takes Panorama, and we can see how Joe Miller's doing around sense of belonging, around emotion regulation, around grit, around growth mindset. And that's really important when we think about wrapping around Joe um, to make sure that Joe and every other student are successful. So that's exciting. And then the last thing I'd say about Panorama is that and this is very exciting. 
we are upgrading our panorama this year. We got some funding um, to be able to upgrade panorama to look at a, a really a holistic approach for every student so that panorama will include on a dashboard academic data, assessment data, social emotional learning data, behavior data, and attendance data. So again, going back to Joe Miller, fourth grader at Pershing Elementary. Now, because of the technology, this is gonna take a few weeks to get this in place. So I'm telling you something that's coming, not that's, that's here yet. Um, but um, you know, I'd say in the next six to eight weeks, um, we should have this in place, which again, is just really exciting to have one place where we can look at that holistic view um, of students or a class or a building or a district. So that's exciting. Gary, would you add anything? I just add two things. Uh, one is the responsive use, uh, the response to the data is we're really drilling down with it. Uh, in our buildings, I, I know that our care teams are using the data when we're talking about students. Resiliency teams are using data when we're talking about trends within the building. Student well-being specialists um, have caseloads of students uh, who have identified as low in our social emotional competencies or measured uh, where they're saying, I'm not seeing myself as, you know, being having being high, I wouldn't rate myself on high as uh, on self-management or emotional regulation. So we're working with students individually one-on-one -on -one in response to the data. The second piece is this is, you know, with SEAL, um, there's that piece of equity in there. Uh, at the secondary level, we are focused in on measuring, you know, equity and inclusion. Uh, there's some good, solid feedback uh, that will be actionable coming off of that as well. So, again, Panorama is, is a great tool uh, for the social most, emotional side, but also when we're looking at um, the equity and inclusion of our schools and our buildings. Next slide. So finally, it, it's this, um, you know, as Joe mentioned this earlier, we know that, you know, it's people over programs. Um, we get that, uh, you know, at the heart of everything we do, we understand that relationships move our system. Um, you know, I know one of the things that uh, folks kid around with our department and wraparound services about uh, is it's constantly, we're always saying Maslow over Bloom. We got to make sure our kids are safe. Uh, they feel welcome, that they belong. Uh, and then from there, we feel like, you know, our students can learn. Um, Joe pointed out earlier, and I think this illustration makes it explicit, um, that, you know, relationships are at the core of everything that we do, and they equal student success. There's a lot of stuff going on under the surface, behind the scenes, but really it's the relationships that, that move, um, move everything that we do in this district. So uh, with that, uh, unless you have anything else, Joe, I'd like to open it up for questions. Anybody have any questions or concerns? Go ahead. I was just going to say thank you for the presentation and giving us an update on that. It's really interesting to see the things that we're doing in the district to, you know, make everyone well and able to really do their best and be their best. And so um, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Just thinking about uh, some of these photographs um, and, and, and the little uh, programs they, they represent um, or not so little. I think if you look at the meal provision during COVID, the bikes and the shoes, and I'm sure there are many other things, but uh, to me, these are things that help students see school as a place um, that cares about them um, and not just a place that may um, require them to do some difficult academic work, um, which is kind of, you know, at my age, we, we grew up in, and that, that's all it was, right? It was just like, you got to go to class and, and you got to do your homework. Um, I do have a question about the process with restorative and trauma-informed. I understand, um, you know, there are things that are being done that um, are not initiated by issues with particular child or particular classroom, but um, can you give me an idea of like the flow chart, if you will, of 
going from uh, teacher becomes aware of student um, acting out in class or um, uh, something happening that could use a restoration circle or whatever. How does that get processed to the point where um, the, the right things happen? So when a student when a student has an issue, um, there are a number of uh, ways that they can involve they, that they can flow to like a, a responsive or a reactive uh, restorative space. They can talk to their counselor, social worker, well-being specialist, um, administrator, teacher. There are a number of different ways that they can get there. Um, from there, if, if there is a conflict that requires mediation, like if we're talking about just the practice of a circle, um, that would be initiated uh, and uh, the well-being specialist and or an administrator and or one of those other set groups can facilitate it. It's just there's not one person that is uh, responsible um, as a restorative leader. I think that's that's a universal piece that we're growing with as a district is a lot of folks within a building are, are restorative leaders. To do a restorative uh, mediation, there would be one-on-one -on -one work with each student, if there's just a two-person group, uh, to prepare them to come into uh, the space. They would enter the space. Uh, there would be some guidelines that are set and established. They would go through the effective questioning of, you know, uh, what happened? What were you thinking? What do you thought? Who's been impacting the harm? And most importantly, how do we make this thing right moving forward? Um, and from there, there's an agreement that's established. And then we, we, we follow that agreement and we move forward. Most importantly, there should be follow up post that with the individuals um, solo, as well as if there's an opportunity, uh, a follow up with them together. And a lot of times there is an opportunity to follow up together. And that's an acknowledgement of, man, I see you. You know, I see that that, that relationship's been repaired. But George, I, I do want to say one thing that's a crucial and important. And this is a great question that you ask is, Majority of our restorative efforts, and this is the shift that we are on the journey with, is if we're really going to be a restorative community, 80% of our practices need to be proactive and positive. They need to be established within the system. Only 20% of our restorative efforts should be in response to harms that have taken place. And I think that like when you're looking at this presentation, there's evidence that we're getting stronger as a restorative community, and that, that's a community of learners. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question uh, on the response and kind of the flow, but really we, we have to keep working towards that 80% positive, 20% responsive. And I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that I, the teacher who observes something is the canary in the coal mine still in many instances, and the professional development that we're doing in these areas um, should be directed, is being directed towards um, them um, being aware of, um, you know, what, what, what is going on, how, how we're handling these things, um, where they can go um, if they think that, um, you know, George <laughs> has a particular problem um, that, that may require, you know, some particular, you know, help. I get that. Agreed, agreed 100%. And as a district, I'm proud. I, I, I would say, I mean, just even the step that every school as a social worker now is huge. So I thank you guys for that. Um, that's helping us along in this trauma informed and restorative journey as well. So uh, we thank you for that. Go ahead, Joanne. I just want to thank you for all the amazing things you're doing. Um, you know, so, so many good things are happening. Um, wherever you guys are and uh, it's really having a great impact on our community and I, I you know as, as a former teacher too I just want to say I'm, I'm really glad that you're working with the staff um, you know there's an old saying if you don't feed the teachers they'll eat, they'll eat the children um, you know really taking care of, of the staff and I hope hope you guys are getting taken care of too because it's it's so important um, so thank you thank you you're welcome thank you. Um, I, have, <clears throat> I have a question. Now that we're a quarter into um, this year um, with all of our schools back, you know, five days a week, I'm wondering if we've been able to, like, if you can give me some examples of things that maybe um, 
<clears throat> we have assessed to find that we need to like fill in wraparound or um, to kind of nurture the the kids back into school or the teachers back into school or whatever um and how we responded to that like if if you've got any examples of that yeah absolutely lisa that's a great question so um i would say that um even though we're back five days a week COVID is still very much with us right as we all know and so it's it's um it's school as much we're trying to make school as normalize school as much as we can but the reality is right for staff for students it's it's different right i mean it's still it, it, it's a challenge so um I, i'd answer your question in two ways one um we know that there um continue we need to continue to pour into the staff right even to joanne's comment right and that um because it's it's challenging right and and that could be everything from you know we ordered cookies and bun cakes and you know various things for parent teacher conferences for the staff right i mean it could be as simple as that right i mean you know just um which you know i probably got five emails today uh, thanking me for the bun cakes <laughs> right which which is you know again seems small but it's a big deal right can be a big deal right greatly appreciated so i mean it could be something like that um it can certainly be uh, on the student side. Um, you know, we're continuing. We recognize that even though our um, food distribution is not continuing on like it it, it uh, um, like it did when we had you know we were doing it Wednesdays or before. Um, we are serving 34 families, 56 children. With we're delivering food once a week to their in partnership. Uh, with a foundation which we just started last week um, to continue that service because we know that's important for those families um, we are we know that behavioral and mental health continue to be a challenge and so not 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 only in addition to the you know additional social workers which gary said it's awesome um, but we continue to look for other ways other partnerships to you know the certainly the children's services fund grant was a part of it but we continue to look for other ways to deepen uh, those services for the students. So those, those would be just a couple examples, right, of um, kind of looking for uh, additional services. And, and Lisa, I'll, I'll give you just three quick examples as well. Um, I would say this, I, I know that as a response to COVID, like you learn a lot through COVID, right? Um, and we had to pivot and change quite a bit. So. Um, beyond for providing for basic needs and resources, I would say this, there's been a change in practice. And I, you know, I was talking to a principal today um, with our counselor and social worker going out and doing some home visits to touch our families on their turf and have conversation uh, conversations with them to help a student at their door. So again, I feel like we've reached out more and that's a, a direct response from COVID. I would say um, second one, um, I'm aware at, uh, and over the past week at one of our schools, we had um, some boys who were struggling. And so we did a proactive, it was actually a responsive approach to get a group of 12 plus boys together in a circle and have a conversation just about what's going on. And honestly, the feedback that I've got um, in the tears that were shed and the, the, the response, the real response to dig beneath the surface um, that's been great just in, in developing good, positive adult to student relationships and having students identify uh, the person that led the circle was a male employee, a male that, a, a figure in their life that they feel comfortable with that they can go to for support. A third one and a final one I would say is this is going back to Panorama. We established like um, a sequence to the work in response to the data that we had this past year as to what our monthly priorities would be um, and points of emphasis working with students. And that's been great out of the gate. We focus on self-management and growth mindset to make sure our kids can get off to a good start. Um, everybody's start is different, is personalized, but again, that's been a point of emphasis. Um, I know this month is October, which can be pretty busy for schools. Um, but with this month, we're looking at emotional regulation and social awareness, again, as a point of emphasis to make sure that we are able to pull ourselves together when, you know, our lizard brain takes over, right? 
So uh, again, those are three other examples that I would give you um, that are granular, but they're real and responsive. So hopefully that helps as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I just would like to say uh, anecdotal evidence of being a parent. I've seen the, uh, the social, emotional, um, restorative work being done by the teachers. Um, you know, the, the questions they ask, the things that they're, they're um, looking for in the students to make sure they, they're well at school. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I've seen it being done firsthand and I, I really appreciate it. So, so thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you. If there's no other questions or comments, we'll move to item 1.3. Um, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Gary. We really appreciate everything. Um, and we'll go to, this is Title I School-Wide Strategic Plans. So good evening, everyone. Um, we are prepared to share our strategic plan for the buildings. Um, as you know, our district has five strategic priorities. Um, our first is, is uh, the modern learning experience. The second is well-being and joy. The third centers around excellent staff. And the fourth is um, all hands, our partnerships. And the fifth is um, really resourcing that vision. So the finances, infrastructure, um, staffing decisions to support that vision. We're very proud of our vision. We believe that it was um, prepared with our families and our students based on what um, they have identified as what they would wanna see uh, for their students. We also have engaged in work with our high school students, our business community, our parents, our students around um, our portrait of a graduate that directly aligns to our vision. Our vision was created pre-COVID. And so to hear you know, the second priority at the federal level for the ESSER funds, was student well-being or social emotional needs of students. So to know that our district had identified that as a strategic priority pre-pandemic um, really speaks to this community's understanding around the notion that if children are not well, they cannot learn. And as you heard in the, power, in the presentation from Joe and Gary, we have some work to do socially emotionally. Um, COVID has really um, harmed many of our young people. And we are seeing that play out at school. And so we have to support them. So Rebecca Soriano has been leading the district strategic planning, I'm sorry, the district's federal programs work for um, several years. She is an expert in this field, has really helped us secure um, grants at the federal level, has made sure that this district is in full compliance at not just the state level, but also on the federal level um, works very closely with our schools on compliance related to federal dollars. And so at this time, she's going to share an overview of our plans. My hope is that there are not too many surprises um, because we have talked about our strategic priorities. So we'll see if um, there are surprises and if we need to do a better job of articulating them. I'll turn it over to Rebecca. All right. Thank you, Dr. Harden. Um, tonight, I wanna um, share with you um, how are Title I strategic plans aligned to the Missouri Assessment Program, Missouri um, School Improvement Program, sorry, not MAP, and also the federal requirements for Title I. So just to, as a reminder, I know all of you are experts on MSIP, but um, MSIP started in 1999. We're currently in the fifth iteration, although the sixth is underway at the state level. Um, it focuses on preparing every child, um, and in U-City we say all means all, um, so does MSIP, um, for sex, success in school and life. Um, it's the account accountability system for accreditation in Missouri. And then very similarly to Title I, MSIP encourages continuous improvement centered around high expectations of clear vision, as Dr. Harden spoke about earlier, and few very focused high impact goals, which I would say are our five strategic priorities. Um, you have observed, I'm sure, in reading our strategic um, plans that they center around our strategic priorities minus the finance um, piece. 
Um, but you'll also notice that the school's um, you know, initiatives under each of those strategic priorities um, are very different. Um, but all of this falls under our district-wide vision of learning reimagined. Um, so like MSIP and Title I, as a district, we focus on implementing initiatives. So we implement, we observe those in actions, we gather our data, and then we evaluate each and everything that we do in an effort to readjust if necessary um, to meet the needs of the students. So when we say that these are living documents, they truly are. These are the documents that principals are using um, for the professional learning com community work, um, for their work with parents. Um, this is the roadmap um, in each of our individual schools. Um, I'm sure you also noticed that University City High School, who entered school impro comprehensive improvement in 1920, um, that their plan is slightly different. Um, we did not have them rewrite um, the plan, their plan, which you can tell is extremely comprehensive, um, to meet our format. Um, but you'll notice that their plan, as I said, is, is robust. And it is centered around five um, pillars. Uh, leadership, collaborative climate and culture, effective teaching and learning, database decision making, and alignment of standards and curriculum, which is very similar to our um, strategic priorities. So again, um, centering around continuous improvement, um, DESE grounded their work in the comprehensive field around the theory of action, which is improve student, le student learning from every student in every school with the primary goal of Missouri students graduating ready for success. Um, so I wanted to make another comment about alignment. Um, we started this work last year. Um, we, we started the revisions of our strategic plans last year in our um, Transformational Leadership Institute. Um, and we were very intentional about making sure that um, our, the school initiatives not only uh, aligned with the district strategic priorities, but those other fingers that come out of that that are very important are, is our professional development. So our strategic plans align with the professional development that our teachers are receiving and also align with our assessment plan. So all three of these things are, are all working together this year. Um, and I think that's something I think that we're really proud of. It was something that we worked really diligently to, to happen and we have that um, in order this year. Um, so finally, I just wanted to say that um, our, our district strategic plan, which I know you've seen, our building plans, including University City High Schools, um, centers around some primary themes, meaning like all children, all means all. Um, we are continuously improving, changing the course. Um, if it's necessary, we change the course. If the data is telling us we need to do something different, uh, we do that. Um, and then finally, that we want to graduate students, whether you know through the portrait of the graduate, through our strategic plans, through our professional development, through our wraparound services, all the things that we do in University City um, so that students are ready to tackle the next phase after graduation. So that's all the um, comments that I had and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Go ahead, Joanne. I think I saw your, your hand up. Yes, yes. I'd like to thank you. I really appreciate the efforts at alignment. I think that's um, really a, you know important thing that you know the more we align all of those forces, um, the more we're going to accomplish with our kids. So it's great to see that thread through those documents. Thank you. Um, a question for you. Um, there were some references to the um, professional learning communities, the PLCs. Um, and I, I we touched on this at a recent meeting too. Um, can you talk about how the efficacy and effectiveness of those is um, being monitored? Um, 
I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I know that the, there's a significant amount of data collection that goes along with the PLCs, and that I know the CNI team is participating in those PLC teams through their residencies. Um, but I'm going to send it to Dr. Hardin for maybe some more specifics about efficacy. Thanks. And I am going to pass it to Dr. Bell, who can answer your question, Ms. Suda. Thank you. So thank you both. Um, so Rebecca is correct. Our team has been working very diligently, immersing themselves in residencies. And in addition to the walkthroughs that they are conducting, they are also very deeply embedded in the PLC process. So that is where they are monitoring the curricular implementation. They are answering questions. They are ensuring that the PLC process is understood and done with fidelity and they receive a lot of feedback. So as a result of the feedback they receive when they meet with individual grade level PLCs and content area teams of teachers, our teams make adjustments, we answer questions, and we provide additional areas of clarity. Um, in addition to answer your question, um, Board Member Suda, you brought up, um, I don't know, maybe several board meetings ago, maybe, you know what, it was the last board meeting in September when Elizabeth Gardner presented the um, PDC presentation, the update, and you asked the question about how we monitor, do we get feedback uh, through kickup in our PLCs? And so we have had uh, a number of discussions with our um, CNI team in our weekly huddle. And we have also taken that conversation to our PDC um, committee, as well as to our larger curriculum committee with all of our facilitators and with CNI. We have discussed that. And we are really trying to devise um, and come up with a plan that would be um, adequate in order to get feedback through kickup um, through our, in our PLCs, that would be one additional way that we can measure efficacy and show it to you, you all, kind of like we do when we do all of our other P, PD programs and provide those um, data points, we will be able to um, give you data and, and statistics and percentages around how uh, staff are feeling with regard to um, their PLCs, but as of right now, we just take anecdotal data, direct um, information from those PLCs and try to answer those questions and provide feedback and clarity. I hope that helps answer. It does, thank you for your answer and thank you for taking a look at it. Um, for the rest of the board, they may know that PLCs can get very granular. There can just be a handful of staff members in a particular PLC and what happens there has just such a, a potential to have an impact, um, but it also has potential to sort of um, not have the impact that it's that's intended if if you know if certain factors aren't in place. So I appreciate you taking a look at that and answering the question. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. And it was really absolutely a good point for us to um, really think about and consider because you're absolutely correct. Um, we want to make sure that PLCs are look fairly consistent across the board. P of course, PLCs have to serve the individual needs of the teacher team, but we wanna ensure that there are some commonalities so that um, you know, PLCs are productive and that we're getting the data that we would like to see. So thank you. Uh, Kashina, I have a, a question. I don't know whether it's for you or not, but I have a question. Uh, could you share with the board uh, the role that the building administrators play in carrying out the strategic plans, the respective strategic plans. The so building I will, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm no, sorry, no. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. So each school writes their own strategic plan in alignment to the larger district strategic plan and they outline building specific goals that they will look to accomplish and achieve over the course of the school year. And um, I think Rebecca kind of outlined those and they're also outlined in um, the documents that you received, but they always have um, from the CNI perspective, a literacy goal and a numeracy goal, as well as a social emotional goal. And so when they write those goals, they work with their leadership teams, their assistant principals and or their TILs, 
And they also work with us on the CNI team, as well as with Dr. Harden Bartley to see those goals through um, throughout the school year. They um, meet with us, they meet with me and my team monthly to talk about how we can support those academic and social emotional goals in each of their buildings. And they also meet regularly with Dr. Harden Bartley to discuss the same thing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Joanne. Yeah, I have one more question. Um, Dr. Bell, you mentioned residencies. I don't know that that's a familiar um, idea to me. Could you explain that for a minute, please? Yes, so residencies are a new structure that we have, we're piloting this school year. And the reason that we are um, using that structure is to really kind of liken our practice to the practices in the medical field where individuals take a deep dive and very intensive study in, in one specific area. And so although it is, of course, not identical to that, we are likening it to that. So our deep dive is to embed ourselves within the school with, within a regular rotation. We have shared that schedule with all of our building leaders. And when we are there, we um, reside and meet with individual teachers, teams of teachers, or grade levels to ensure that um, the curriculum is understood and being implemented with fidelity to support instructional practices in the classrooms. And of course, to also um, embed in the PLCs where teachers are actually doing that planning and collaboration. So that's kind of what we're doing with our PLCs this year. It is a new concept. It's a new structure. And so we are trying it out. We're finding a lot of success and we're getting a lot of good feedback and we hope that we are providing a lot of good feedback. Um, but we'll of yeah. course continue to evaluate that. And if we need to make some adjustments, we will do that. Sounds like a great thing to try. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if it's my turn, uh, thank you for that explanation of the residency. And the way I'm hearing it, <clears throat> it strikes me that this is really um, one of the things that is a benefit to our district of our relatively small size and our full administrative staff relative to that size. So um, we have the opportunity to dedicate administrators to spend that time in all of the buildings in that manner that may not be central office staff <clears throat> in other districts may be stretched too thin to be able to do all that and spend that time in each school. So I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, I have a simple question. Um, on the uh, title of this presentation, it says title one, school-wide strategic plans. And I was a little confused about the reference to Title I um, because at first I thought, well, that means this is somehow in response to um, the kind of federal paperwork requirements that Rebecca is so good at um, complying with. But what, what, what is the reason why it says Title I? It, it says Title I because we're trying to um, fulfill the federal requirement for Title I school-wide plans, as well as our district strategic plans. Um, so in I was sharing with some of the other board meet, members in a meeting we had this week, um, you know, the federal government wants a school-wide plan and the district wants a school plan. So in order to not have the, the principals do um, duplicative work, um, we try to align as much best we can um, our strategic plans to our school-wide plans. So we're basically checking the box um, on both of those requirements. So that's why I have um, strategic in parentheses. But so basically um, the long and short of it is we take our, I take these strategic plans at the building's right, and then I am able to input them into EPEGs in the school-wide Title I school-wide plan. Um, so that's one less thing that our building leadership teams have to do. So that's why. But, but the plans are um, ultimately submitted to the federal government. Yes. Um, the yes. Department of Education. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
that's a compliance matter for you. Absolutely. You it's a requirement to get the money. I mean, there, there's <laughs> those have to be um, district and then each building. So um, yes, those have to be um, completed every single year, updated and completed every single year and uploaded. Uh, just a final comment. Um, for, there are, um, especially on the high school one, I noticed um, specific dates set for various um, things, you know, 90 days, December right. 2021, et cetera. Um, that's great. I mean, that's consistent with, you know, good planning. Um, and I guess it's, it's obvious that there needs to be follow up on that and that those may be revised if um, targets are not met. Um, and I guess I, we may be able to go a whole year, but I think maybe, you know, the board needs to see the follow up at some point, see the progress. It, yes. it, it, it could be a whole year that we, when we do that, that's, you know, for us all to decide, I guess. Well, we use the data, we'll use the data from this school year around each of the um, initiatives under each of the school's priorities to then do their, you know, to revise their plan for the following year. So we, we are um, continuously looking at the data and continuously um, updating as, as needed. The, 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 the high school format is different. Um, that is the you know, dictated format from the state for Title I comprehensive. So that you know, being comprehensive, mm -hmm. they needed the 30, 60, 90 um, uh, cutoffs. But Thank surely you. I can speak to Dr. Harden about providing some updates um, later on in the school year, absolutely. Um, I have a follow-up question on procedure. I know in the past um, we've had community engagement on um, the, the school strategic plans. Is that in, in the works as a plan coming up or not? We have, we ha in the past, we had done that at the high school um, and we've tried, you know, with, with every school presenting their plan. Um, we have really, uh, I think, firmed up the school level um, fall meetings where they're presenting their plans. And then the federal government has added a spring required building level plan where schools will have to present again in the spring. So that's a new addition. And we felt like that um, really was enough um, and didn't feel like we needed to have uh, another meeting um, to, to go over the same thing. But, but we already we've already done that with at the school level. they had they had their they shared their plans at their okay. curriculum nights in the um, in in August September and then they will present again um, to their to their communities again in April okay thank you mm -hmm. any other uh, questions or comments Uh, board member Bellows, I did want to add on the residencies. I apologize if anyone was caught off guard. I did not want you all to not have information. We did include information on the residencies and the Friday note also if you want additional details. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dr. Bell. Okay, and thank you. Thank, you, uh, thank you, Rebecca, for spearheading our compliance with the federal requirements. I know when I hear that, um, I apologize. When I hear that, my eyes roll back in my head. So thank you for doing that. I, uh, I know it's a very important and uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right. Well, if there's no other questions or comments, we will move to item 1.4, the return to school update. It's week six. <laughs> and it feels like month six. Um, it's been a lot and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Um, it's been a lot and as one of our principals frequently says, we got this. So I'm gonna give you an update. Um, we can go to the next slide. Our goal is to um, give you updates. The board have requested updates 
um, every meeting, we might want to revisit that because the data doesn't really change now that we're back in school. So maybe we would want to go to a monthly update in lieu of an every meeting update. Um, we want to make sure, I want to give you an update on the incentive for COVID and then um, our approach to returning or having our students in person. So we're safe, we're healthy, we're flourishing, and we're connected. And I should add that it's hard. Yep, it's hard. Um, vaccine update, this is a celebration. We have 29 individuals who are not fully vaccinated. There's no judgment, um, we're working with those individuals. We have a process that um, our HR department has developed where they submit their test every week. Um, we had 100% participation that started on Monday of this past week that would have been the fourth. And we had 100%, I would say 99.1. I think we had one person who we had to follow up with. But still, that's a great um, metric. We have um, an October vaccination clinic that we want to hold. Um, and then we also have boosters that are now available anywhere, really, for anyone who received the Pfizer vaccine. And we are encouraging our staff to get the booster. I have um, talked to Dr. Jason Newland, who is our partner at WashU. He believes that the um, Pfizer vaccine for children five through 11 may be available as early as November 5th. Um, that is based on the information that is very public. I'm not giving secret information, but the um, there has been, it will be under review at the end of the month by the FDA. And so if that review goes well, we could have the vaccine available, the Pfizer vaccine available for five to 11 by November 5th. I've already asked the student services team to begin to outreach with our partners about hosting a clinic in the district, if that were to happen. We're going down. If you're watch, watching the metrics, um, our numbers are trending downward, not by a lot, um, but we are we are going at a in a, a different direction than we were even two weeks ago. Next slide. You'll see our age groups, um, and this is as of October fourth. You see that um, positivity rate, which is seven point five, which was similar to the previous slide. Our rolling average, slight decrease, not a lot. Um, but we're seeing a reduced number of hospitalizations, um, a reduced number of deaths, and a reduced number of positive cases. This is U City, um, the area in the, the lighter uh, purple. So we are in the lighter purple, which is great. Um, so our numbers are also um, declining. This is our dashboard. Um, we have had some classrooms that had to be quarantined. So our numbers for students is a little bit higher than we're normally used to seeing. If you look at our staff back uh, quarantine, that is primarily due to staff, staff members being vaccinated. Um, when staff members are vaccinated, um, it, it significantly um, changes how we contact trace and how we quarantine. So we're at 92% a vaccination for staff or full-time employees with the district. And that is support staff and um, teaching staff. So I wanna commend our staff. Um, I wanna commend our teachers association as well as our support staff association. And again, we're still working with the, our employees who um, are not vaccinated and we wanna be humane and support them as well. Next slide. Homecoming was fun. Um, no, there's, there's no place like home. It was small and intimate and it really highlighted the high school. If there had been a float um, awardee, it would not have been an elementary school. <laughs> the elementary schools always um, just show up. So it was nice to celebrate our high school students. <laughs> See some um, photos reflected there. Just FYI, Miss Fort Williams, you're not on mute, just in case. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, next slide. So here's a quick video of the game.
So it was a fun game. We um, beat Clayton um, 56 to 6. So <laughs> it was a nice win. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Upcoming events, our parent conferences conclude this evening. Um, and they were virtual and our staff have been celebrated by PTO organizations, Wyman, as you heard earlier, and our principals with lunch and dinner. And so they have tomorrow as a comp day and there's no school for students tomorrow. Um, this was something that was negotiated with our parents and our teachers through the calendar committee. Um, uh, there is a community flu shot uh, clinic on October 9th at Jackson Park, which is Saturday. It is a Saturday, um, but we, we were able to get that date with the county and we wanted to go ahead and move forward. There's also a fun entrepreneurship showcase at the high school. Um, we'll have some student entrepreneurs. We have a teacher who's going to be selling some items to benefit UCEF. So it'll be a fun event. So if you want to purchase some things and get some UC swag and just support our kids, come by to high school. Um, we have a check-in at Brittany Woods coming up next week. Um, we have a COVID uh, vaccine clinic as well on the night, on the 14th of October. And Gary, this will be for the first shot and second shots? That is correct. Yeah, first shot, second shot, and we will provide the booster uh, for those who are 28 days past their uh, Pfizer. So that, and thank you, Gary. So that information will come out in a communication from me tomorrow. Um, early release is the next Friday. Um, and then we have Trunk or Treat and our Pumpkin Stroll at Jackson Park on Halloween weekend. And there will be a district-wide STEAM Expo. We are crossing our fingers that we can do it in person, but I don't know if we can. But it is um, November 16th. And you will hear very soon from me regarding the district state of the district meeting that normally happens in December. So we will hopefully be able to um, get that back and be able to communicate and engage our community. Coco, um, this is um, Hispanic Heritage Month. And so one of our teachers, um, Mr. Yanos at the high school has organized a, um, a free family movie night in honor of um, Hispanic Heritage Month. It will be next Wednesday, the 13th at the high school. Um, it's Coco, which is a very sweet and fun film. If you haven't seen it, it is a treat. So doors open at 6.30 and the movie begins promptly at seven. Masks are required and we will have social distancing between family and groups in place. I can address these are some photos of our babies. We always like to show them off and I can address any questions the board may have. I cannot see everybody. So go ahead and speak up if. Just to, you know. I'm you... So, go ahead, Lise. I'm sorry. I didn't have my speaker on, but go ahead. So, okay. Do you um, feel like, um, like we can see the direct impact of the vaccines with the, the staff. Um, do you feel like the um, testing program through WashU has, has made an impact on um, helping us keep, um, keep like asymptomatic spread and things like that down? Yes, um, we have seen, we have been able to address those asymptomatic individuals and we also have been able to test um, family members so that they don't come to school. So we've been able to identify positive cases. Um, I will say that our numbers are the highest of any of the five districts, but I wish our numbers were higher. I wish we had more of our students and staff participating in the study, but okay. so far it has been a, a valuable resource. You mean like the number of people who are actually getting tested? Is that what you mean by the highest? The num we are the highest of the individuals who have consented Consented. To sign the consent form to be a part of the study. Gotcha. We have mm -hmm. the highest participation. 
We do not have the highest number tested because our school is the smallest. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Port, uh, for, for Williams, you had a question? Yes, Sharonica, you mentioned at the top of your presentation that uh, you were hoping that we would go to uh, having the, um, what is that, the uh, updates, uh, maybe once a month instead of once every two weeks. Uh, is it any way possible we can consider, re or consider going to once a month after the new year? Absolutely. Yeah, and the only reason I say that is because sometimes with, with this COVID and this variant, things happen so quickly. They turn around quickly and, and they can go either way. Not that I'm expecting it to go anywhere but down at this point, but we can never tell. And I do find those updates helpful, you know. So maybe we can look at it again after the new year. I didn't uh, plan on changing anything until the board asked me to. So I will do them every meeting as long as the board um, would like me to do them. Absolutely. Hey, okay. um, Thank you. No problem. Dr. Harden Barley and, and Laverne, um, I think maybe we should uh, have a board discussion about that possibly next meeting, um, just to see how everyone feels about it. I mean, I, I do like your suggestion of going to monthly after the new year, because um, again, you're right, things do change quickly. Um, but I just want a consensus on the board on that because um, I agree. I think I think given the vaccination rates that we have and, and the fact that the five to eleven is going to be hopefully coming soon, um, you know, it may not need a two week every two week update. Yes, Matt, I understand that. I I didn't expect it to be any other way. I just wanted to mention it at this meeting because that's when Dr. Harden presented. No, I'm not. You know, I'm, I'm glad you did because I, yeah, I think we need to have a discussion about it. Yeah, and I'm sure we will. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just think we need a lot of caution in our outlook on what's going on with COVID. Um, and it's great to be optimistic always, right? Um, and the graph is certainly headed in the right direction looking at, I'm just looking at the positivity rate, a graph that we have in here. Um, but, you know, we had that spike that was holiday time, right? It was people getting together for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Um, and you can see that on that graph. Now, it is a, it is a big difference that we have the rate of vaccinations that we have. So that is a good reason to be optimistic, but the possibility that we have a, another seasonal spike, I think is still there, but I'm no expert. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, George. Anybody else have any questions or comments? All right, if not, thank you, Dr. Harden Barley for that presentation. We always appreciate it. Um, item 1.5, the YWCA St. Louis Head Start Early Education Program, MOU. This is an annual MOU that we approve um, for uh, services that we provide to uh, the YWCA Head Start Program. Um, it is pretty much the same language, um, and I can address any questions you may have. This will be for approval at the next uh, board meeting. Are we still looking at our students receiving services um, outside of the district boundaries? We right now um, we have a handful of students who are not within U City, based on this partnership. But the majority of the students are in U City, and it depends on um, enrollment and depends on need. Where where are the classrooms that our kiddos are using? Um, right now, none, because we don't have a lot of students. So this is an annual routine um, approval that we have in place. Um, but because of COVID, many of the families are not comfortable bringing their children in person. Um, so I don't, we don't have any students coming into our buildings. But right now, we do have one classroom and some of our um, half-day programs that will be available if students were to come in. 
Thank you. So we're servicing Head Start students here in U City. For some reason, I thought we were they were they were going to a classroom in Normandy, maybe. It depends on enrollment, and so I'm speaking of right now. So it varies. We do have students in Normandy. Um, we do have students in U City. At times, there are students at UCCC, uh, University City Children's Center. So it just depends on the families and where they're situated. So if the board would like for me to get some specific information from Ms. Colley, I can get that in preparation for the vote next at the next board meeting. Okay, um, I'm, I'm satisfied with, with this. I just wondered if you want to bring it to us, if the rest of the board wants it. It might be helpful just to know who we're servicing. So I can certainly do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, no problem. Is this an MOU that I I'm, I'm trying to like remember everything I know it, I get a little confused about where the classrooms are like Joanne's talking about and stuff like that, but is this an MOU where we would need to add the COVID language, the vaccine language. I'll look at any MOU that we have, um, we would need to make sure that we have the vaccine language so yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But the. To be clear, we provide the service. So our it's our teachers. So there are no adults coming in. There's so no, there's nobody know. coming from the, no. the YWCA then into no, our I just building. had to think about your question. No, there's no yeah. YWCA staff. It is our staff providing the service to students in Head Start. Okay. But I'll take a look at it to see if we need to add some additional COVID language. Anybody else have any questions or comments about the MOU? I, I do have one more question. Um, sorry to keep um, belaboring this. So the last the last time I thought I, well, I thought that there were supposed to be dedicated Head Start classrooms. Are... No, we, haven't, we haven't had dedicated Head Start classrooms in at least three years. Um, we used to when I first actually was when I first started, we had one classroom where the music room is now that mm -hmm. classroom moved out. Um, I don't know where they went, but I will get some more information from Ms. Colley and share that with the board so that I can speak intelligently. I don't have that information, but I will okay. get it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have any questions or comments? on the MOU. All right, if not, we can move to item 1.6, or I'm sorry, 2.1, the Board of Education budget. Um, as you can see, um, if you have it all pulled up, I, um, I don't know if everyone's reviewed it, but um, it, it's a little hard to track just because the years are so different on, on as far as what has been spent. Um, but please look it over, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, we can we can discuss those right now. Um, you know, as far as far as I was looking at it, the only thing that was real different was the. Um, uh, and again, year to year, they're they're so different. But if you look at like the 1920 actual like Board of Education conferences to 2021, it's it's relatively close. Um, you know, just the bottom line looks so different from 1920, just because again, that year we didn't have election services, uh, professional services wasn't very high um, and whatnot, but it seems year to year, everything's pretty much in line, um, not any huge changes. Um, but if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to talk. What is the school election services for twenty thousand dollars? Um, I would imagine it's to hold hold the elections within. The yes, school. that is that is what it costs. Uh, last year we uh, that was the fee that we owed to hold the election was um, over eighteen, almost nineteen thousand dollars, from the St. Louis County Board of Elections. That was their fee. So the budget this year is we have it budgeted for 20. 
And we, of course, we haven't spent the money this school year, but that's the budget, as you see in 21, 22. That's where we start each year, or this school year is where we're starting. And then the other two columns are what were, were actually spent the past previous uh, or prior school years. I'm sorry, Matt. No, no, that's that's a great explanation. Thanks, More Julie. than I yeah. knew. I just, I just thought, silly me, I assumed that like that's a government function and the county or somebody else pays for it, but it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. No, um, so the 1920 school year, we didn't hold an election. We didn't have to. Right. And that's so, why that was $25. So we saved a lot of money. Um, yeah. About the MSBA conference now, um, my understanding was they're not offering a virtual um, alternative. And I don't know how many people are planning to actually go physically. Is that going to change this number? Yes. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, I believe, Nancy. Um, the 2400 actually, that was built in. That was previously paid for all board members to go to the conference. We are going to be reimbursed. I just got the email this afternoon, late this afternoon from MSBA that they are reimbursing us for board the board members that will not be attending plus the superintendent. So that number will change. Yeah. About two hundred and fifty dollars, or well, it'll be more than that because it'll be hotel fees, but it'll be less than twenty four hundred. Anyone anybody, else? Have, oh, go ahead, Joanne. Sorry, I should have raised my hand. Is anybody attending the conference? We have one member uh, attending. Yes. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay, if not, um, we can go ahead and move to item 3.1, citizen comments. Um, your Board of Education is very interested in citizen input and concerns and has allotted a period of 30 minutes during our board meeting for citizens and staff to address us. We ask that remarks be limited to four minutes and that you please speak to issues. The board cannot discuss personnel matters or individual student concerns in public sessions. Citizens who wish to comment about a particular agenda item may do so during the citizen comments section. No comments will be taken from citizens during the regular board meeting or work session. Attendees wishing to participate in the citizen comment section of the meeting must sign up in advance prior to the meeting with their name, address, email, phone number, and topic of comment. Comments will be read during the comment part of the meeting. It is our intent to conduct the meetings in a manner that is at all times respectful to our students, staff, community members, and fellow board members. Julie, do we have any comments for tonight? There are no comments this evening. All right. Um, well, if there are no comments tonight, then um, can I get a, I have to motion to move into executive session, um, closed session, um, following the conclusion of this work session for personnel matters and superintendent evaluation. Can I get a motion for that? So moved more. Second, Brenner. Any discussion? All right, Laverne. Aye. George. Aye. Dr. Stewart. Aye. Tracy. Aye. Joanne. Aye. Lisa. Aye. Aye. All right. It is 7:11. So how about five minutes? Uh, we'll come back into exec session at 7:16. Okay. We'll see you all then. Thank you.